verse 24. Luke chapter 15, verse 24. We know the story about the first part. We know how that the younger brother left, went to his father one day and said, hey, I've had enough, I've had it. Give me my money. I'm getting out of here. Well, the father loved him. Father cared about him. Father gave him his share of the inheritance. And uh, he went off to the far country. Got over in the far country, ended up losing everything that he had, lost his self-respect. Ends up being a pig farmer, which is the worst thing a Jew could do would be a pig farmer. He ends up being a pig farmer, eating, he, eating pig slop. And then while he's there in the pig pen, slopping the hogs, eating the pig slop, he says, when he came to himself, he said, I'll go back to my father. Well, he went back to his father. Father threw a party. We all know the story. Great story. Wonderful story. We identify with the prodigal and because all of us at one time or another have gone astray. But yet, we see in verse 24 that as the father was rejoicing about the son, he said, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry, having a party because the prodigal had returned. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And verse 28, I want you to see verse 28. I want you to look at it real close. Little brother has been out, and nobody knew where he was, what was happening to him, whether he's dead or alive. Little brother has been missing for all this time, and notice what it said, and he was angry. I mean, can you believe that that says that? Little brothers come home, and he was mad about it, and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out to him. His father came out and treated him. What's the deal, boy? What's going on? He answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Liar. He's a liar. That's not true. He wasn't perfect. Guarantee you he'd messed up. He guarantee you had the uh, father told him to do something. He's human. Well, he lied there. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet Thou never gave us me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which was devoured thy living with harlots, you've killed for him the fatted calf. And he said, son, I'm getting too much out of this, I know, but here after all that, the father still looks down and says, son, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This whole chapter is a parable, but it's in three stories. We see the lost sheep that represents lost sinners, we see the lost coin, that represents lost talents. And we have the lost son, it represents lost fellowship. And although three stories are involved, they all have the same meaning. Restoration. <laughs> Amen. However, the elder brother represents the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious folk that Jesus dealt with all the time. And, and that's who Jesus was speaking to. I mean, I don't know, have you ever looked at that? I mean, he's speaking to the religious scribes and Pharisees. I mean, he's giving them a message right in their face about how they are. And the reason for this, this parable is because of the criticism Jesus was receiving in verses 1 and 2. You can check that later. But I want you to note four, uh, four possibilities that existed in the life of the elder brother and in the life of the scribes and the Pharisees and could very well exist in your life and in my life. 
I want to talk to you tonight about a poor brother. A poor brother. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, I pray now that you'll help me as I speak. God, we need your anointing tonight. Because, God, you're the same God whether we have 200 here or whether we have 100 here. You're the same Lord. You knew who was going to be here when you spoke to my heart about the message. And, God, I pray tonight that you'll help me to preach with power, help me to preach with urgency, help me to preach with conviction. I pray, God, with anointing, you'll let me speak. And while I talk to people on the outside, you talk to them on the inside. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Four possibilities that existed in the life of the elder brother and in their life and maybe in our life. First of all, falling without going to the far country. Falling without going to the far country. The younger brother went, the elder brother stayed at home. That's what it says in verse 29. He answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I served you, and neither transgressed I thy law, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Folks, that's a condition of a lot of people in church. They're in church, but they're out of Christ. They've been starched and ironed, but have not been washed in the blood of Jesus. So you don't have to go to the far country to be away from the Father. I mean, that's a misnomer. A lot of people think that, that you, well, hey, I, I, I'm not out drinking and I'm not gambling and, and I'm not going to bars and, and I'm not on dope and, and I'm not doing this or I'm not that. I'm going to tell you something. You, 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 you can fall without going to the far country. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, For unto us the, was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. He said in Hebrews 5, 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Talking to the church. The church being dull of hearing. So here's the condition. You can fall without going to the far country. You can fall sitting right here in church. You can, you can never miss a service. You can go to Sunday school and Bible study and, 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 and sing and whatever. But the, see, the, as we'll end up in the message, we're going to get there in a minute. Relationship is what it's all about. This young man stayed at home. He did not go to a far country, but he was in a bad condition spiritually. Falling without going to the far country. Well, the next condition I believe that he was in, and we know the scribes and Pharisees were in, and we can be in, is service without fellowship. Service without fellowship. See, he was mistaken about, about what his father wanted. He thought that the father's main concern was in flocks and fields and money, but it wasn't. And folks, I want you to understand, the father's greatest concern is not about classes and committees, buses and boards, ministry of the homeless, and etc. His primary concern was his sons and their fellowship with him. The father would have given all he possessed to have his sons at home and be in right relationship with him. And this should tell us something very, very important. Our fellowship with Christ is more important than our service for him. You write that down in your heart if you're not writing it down on paper. Our fellowship with Christ is more important than our service for him. I mean, we can look at Jonah and get a prime example of that, how that Jonah went and preached the greatest revival message ever preached in the annals of history. He goes out and with a, with, with a one-line message, repent or perish, and he's out of there. 600,000 people got saved on a one-line sermon. Jonah preaching, repent, get right with God, uh, or you perish. And, and the whole city came to Christ in sackcloth. Even the king was in sackcloth and ashes. 
Our fellowship with Christ is more important. But then uh, notice about Jonah. Jonah then leaves the greatest revival in history, and he goes out and says, I just want to die. Something wrong with Jonah's fellowship, wasn't there? He finally, after spending three days in a whale's belly, he finally went and did the work. He went and did the service, but his heart wasn't in it. You see that? His heart wasn't in it. And God was just as displeased with that as he was when he said, I ain't going to Nineveh to start with. Our fellowship with Christ is more important than our service for him. Look at Mark 3, 14. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. He chose 12 for two reasons, that they should be with him in fellowship, and, and notice that, and send them forth, that's service. Fellowship was first, then service. The lesson is God wants us to spend time with him. That should be a standard for leaders. I'd rather have leaders in this church who couldn't recognize their names written across the side of a barn in red paint, but who live a clean, dedicated, consistent life and know the Lord, they're filled with the Holy Ghost, spend time alone with God, than one who has more degrees than a thermostat or a thermometer, and, 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 but yet they're as carnal as a hog. I'd rather have leaders that spend time with God than to have guys with money, guys with degrees, but yet they're carnal. If I have to choose between fellowship and service, God would have me spend more time with him. And that's where the church is missing it. That's where many times we miss it. We think some way, somehow, I mean, are we Jehovah's Witness? Are we working our way? I mean, is that what we are? I mean, we do our stuff. There's some of us have looked at it that way for years. Yes, do I believe we ought to work? Well, you know better than that. You know we ought to work. We ought to do things for God. But sometimes I, I want to ask, well, why we do it? Is it because we love him or it's because we're trying to work our way to heaven? Are we doing what we do because we love Jesus, want to be close to him? Or are, are, are we doing it because we, we think that it's some way on the, uh, the, 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 the brownie point system? If I have to choose between fellowship and service, God would have me spend more time with him in fellowship. You remember Dale Hudson? There's few of you here in the room remember Dale Hudson. Dale Hudson was a staff member here, one of the most driven young men I've ever met in my life. He was one of the key factors that had our attendance you know, up, I mean, 1,800 on buses, things like that. I mean, it was a, a phenomenal. One day, though, Dale was in. I mean, D Dale was so hyper that sometimes he would, uh, well, for example, they moved in uh, to the parsonage over there, and they moved in late one night at 6 o'clock in the morning they already had all the furniture set up in the house. Every picture hung. I've never seen nothing like it in my life. I'm telling you what, he unloaded late that night, but the next morning they had everything, curtains up, I mean, books in the shelves, um, everything. The whole house was done. Because old Dale, blah, 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 like a pinball, man. He just, he, he's bounced around. And one day Dale was at the church, his little old wife and two boys was over there by themselves like they always was. And I, I, I called him in my office. I said, Dale, wait a minute. Before you leave, I, 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 I want to talk to you. I said, you got a little wife over there and two boys that you need to spend time with. You need to be loving on them. And I said, Dale, I'm going to tell you something. There's some things that are more important than soul winning. He looked at me like I'd hit him with a two before. He said, Dr. Linton, how, what in the world are you? I said, Dale, some things are more important than soul winning. And I say to you, whoever you are here tonight, some things are more important than other things, but it's not the things you think. Fellowship with the master is the most important thing. See, you can't fellowship too much with God. Most would rather do that. I got a statement here. I want you to see if, if, if you agree with this. Most would rather, would rather do than be. <laughs> right? Most would rather do than be. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain to you. 
See, in other words, most would rather do stuff. Teach, sing, visit, preach, play music, do homeless ministry, drive a bus, work with kids. Most folks would rather do those things than what Psalm 4, 4 tells us to do. To stand in awe and sin not, commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Throw that up there if you can find it. There it is. Stand in awe, sin not, commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Now listen, y'all that know me well know that that's hard for me to do. I mean, we go, I know I've been talking about the lake house quite a bit lately, and that, that's not to throw, act like that, you know, that that's a big deal because it's not. But, but I go down there and I'll sit down in a chair. I mean, we hadn't been down there in a month, but I, I'm just saying we, uh, uh, we go down, we sit down, and, and we look at the water, and it's beautiful, and it? Brother Robert's beautiful, isn't it, sitting there in, in, that, in that little den, and, and looked at the pelicans and the eagles and, and you know, seeing the fish flop, and, and it's, one, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm all consumed with it for about five minutes. That looks like the same eagle that flowed through a while ago. And pelicans all look alike. I mean, I got to look around for something to do. Well, I want you to understand that. That's the way many of us are in our relationship with God. We'll do stuff, but Psalm 4610, I want you to see this one. He said, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. I'd rather knock a hundred doors than do that. I'd rather get up here and preach a hundred sermons than do that. To just be still and be with God like he's my friend. I mean, hey, I've got some friends I love to spend time with. I mean, you look at my phone, you, you see a lot of text, and I've got friends across the country that some of them text me every day. Every day they text me, they call me. We, we're friends, so we have fellowship with each other all the time. We're always in communion with each other. But I want you to understand, that's the way God would desire it with us. But most of us would rather do than be. So we have service without fellowship. If the fellowship is right, the service will fall in line. Are you listening to me? If the fellowship is right, then the service will fall in line. By the way, we've heard from several key men in our church about worship. When are we going to get it? When are we going to do it? Service without Fellowship. Number three, the characteristics I see in this young man, and we definitely see in the scribes and Pharisees, but also we might see in me and you, is heirship without happiness. Heirship without happiness. The elder son, according to the father, was heir to all his father had, but he was unhappy. I mean, did not his father say, son, everything I have is yours? But he was still unhappy. Inside the house was music, there was feasting, there was singing, there was laughing, but out in the yard there was a boy sitting alone with a big frown on his face. His problem goes back to his fellowship. His fellowship was with his work and his friends, but it wasn't with his father. The fellowship he had, I'm talking to some of you workaholics now, the fellowship that he had was with his work. Notice what he said when the father gets out to him. What does he bring up? What did he bring up? He brought up how, much, how hard he had worked, right? God, I've done all, hey, Father, I've done all this stuff. I've done, I've done all, and, you know, here, I fed the cows, you know, I slopped, uh, it, you know, the, the sheep. Uh, I, I've been fed, I've worked like a dog. I've I worked my fingers to the bone. Luke chapter 15, verse 26, he called one of the servants and said, 
what, what does these things mean? And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, the father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him safe and sound. And he was angry and wouldn't go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. He had to ask a hired servant the secret to happiness. He had to ask a hired servant the secret to happiness. Now, I've got a big one here for you. Y'all ready for a big one? Having things doesn't bring happiness. Having things doesn't bring happiness. I said, having things doesn't bring happiness. If that's what your happiness is found in. God has blessed me and my family with things. This church has provided for me for many years and has provided for me well. God has also given me other opportunities out that where, God, where he has shown grace and mercy to me, has provided for me almost beyond belief at times. But I would give all of it I'd give every bit of it for a certain person in my family to hit this altar and live for Jesus. Wouldn't you, Doug? Doug's been blessed financially. Doug's been blessed hard to business. But he's got a boy out there in the far country. No matter how much money we bring and how much stuff we get and how fancy a vehicle we drive. Shannon, it, none of that stuff matters. We can drive an $80,000 pickup. But with all the bells and whistles in the pickup, we still got a loved one, somebody we love that's out in the far country. Having things doesn't bring happiness. You may have everything you've ever wanted, but without fellowship with Jesus, you don't have anything. And those things will fade away, but Jesus won't. Hallelujah, Jesus won't. And last of all, what this young man had, what the scribes and Pharisees had, and what you and I may have, he had sonship without brotherhood. Sonship without brotherhood. Just like the scribes and Pharisees, the elder son provided himself with being straight in his doctrine, strict in his living, dedicated to his service, but he had no use for his brother. I know we're few in number, but listen to this. You can be straight in your doctrine, strict in your living, dedicated to your service, but yet not have any use for your brother. He was a poor brother. He was a poor brother. It sticks out in this chapter. Notice in verse 17, the younger brother came to himself up above that before where we started reading. He said he came to himself. That's the key to true repentance. He came to himself and, 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 he, and he made things right. Went back home. He was there in the hog pen. He says, I, I, he, he said that, that, I mean, did you see that? Bread enough to spare. I mean, even the servants in my, in the father's house had bread enough to spare. Good free will Baptist doctrine. There's love enough, grace enough, mercy enough, power enough to change every sinner in the world and still have enough for me to live on. That's what that says. Younger brother realized this in verse 18 through verse 20. This ain't right. I'm not at Father's house. I'm not in fellowship with my father. 
I, I'm, I'm just not in fellowship with my father. And, and, and here he was, and he began to rehearse all the bad stuff going on in his life. And by the way, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And then finally one day, he comes home. I believe every day the father would have the supper table set in hopes of his son coming home. I believe that. Around the Linton house, we, uh, you, my, I believe my children would testify to this. When they come to my house and, and, and we, fix, we fix a meal, I promise you there's going to be enough food. There's always going to be enough food. Uh, when, uh, I mean, is that not right? Uh, uh, well, can, can we bring a friend? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, evidently that's, uh, I mean, I know Gwenda's that way. She fixes for I don't know how many all the time. And, and they bring their friends and their doctors and lawyers, Indian chief buddies, and they, you know, they all come over. But uh, I understand, and this father, I believe he was that way. That's how parents are. I can see the elder brother looking at that table. He hasn't seen need for all that food on the table. I mean, look at all the money that stuff cost. And, man, I, I got this table set, and, I mean, what in the world? There's just us. I've had people complain about the money we spend on building, the money we spend on ministry, the money that we spend on food for people. But this older brother, I'm almost done, so, so set up and listen. Father put a table out every night. Older brother sat there meal after meal with no concern for his own brother. He probably even complained to his father about the other brother saying, well, it's his own fault. While he's cutting up a ribeye. It's his own fault. He brought it on himself, Dad. Folks, prodigals don't need this. They already know it. We got prodigals in our family. You do too. And listen, they don't need to know how sorry they are. They, are, they already know it. Deep down inside, they know. How do I know that? Because the Word of God tells me that. They may not live it, but they got an inside of it. If, if, if it's been put in them, it's there. It's his own fault. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, right there is the key, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Let me tell you why he was a poor brother. Every meal he ate, there was an empty place over there at the table. There was an empty chair, an empty plate. And at the same time, he had a brother who was hurting and starving to death. And not one time did he ever have a thought to get the two together. Sitting at the head of the table, he had a daddy that had a broken heart. He saw that daddy as he would look at the empty chair and look at the empty plate and look at the empty spot of the table. He saw that day after day after day. But never one time did he ever have a thought to get the two together. He wasn't disturbed over the empty seat. He wasn't disturbed over the empty plate in the father's house. He didn't care if anybody ever sat at the seat and was fed. Uh, he didn't care. He didn't care uh, uh, what it was doing to the father. You know why? Because he was a poor brother. That's why. He was poor. I'm going to throw some things out at you and I'll be done. He never talked to the father about the absent brother. I 
I know I may be speculating here a little bit, but hey, I think I can prove it. He never talked to his father about the absent brother. Now the story could have read like this. Father, I, man, I couldn't sleep last night. I was worrying and praying for, 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 for baby brother. Well, I, can't, I rolled and I tossed and I turned because, man, we don't know where he's at and what kind of trouble he's in. What, uh, uh, man, man uh, father, 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 we got to do something about this. But it didn't. It didn't read like that. He had a lost brother and not one time did he talk to the father. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you prayed for one of your brothers who have fallen? When's the last time you prayed earnestly, talked to the father about the lost brother? He was a poor brother. This speaks of faithfulness in church. He wasn't even there when, when, when his brother finally did come home. What about attendance? I mean, church is where we get our strength. See, you can't afford to let down your faithfulness to your church. We ought to want to go because the prodigal one day is going to come home one day, and we don't want to miss it. You know how many times when I've seen prodigals in this building that I can just almost taste them coming and getting right? Any of y'all remember, uh, I mean, I can say this because uh, they're, they're, none of them is here tonight. Y'all remember when Deborah Graves was, was out in the far country? Some of y'all can remember that. You know, for, I don't know, a long year or two. Uh, she wasn't singing with her family. She went to the far country. That same girl that stood here today and made you cry while she sang. But when she would come to church, I can remember thinking, today may be the day that she... My, my wife talked to her, texted her all, all the time, back and forth during that time. Texting back and forth about her need and about her spiritual condition. But on that day when she finally come down that aisle right there, hit that altar, wept her way through to Jesus and, and got back in fellowship with God, man, what a wonderful, wonderful day that was. And we have the testimony here every Sunday with them singing. They're singing, it's Sky took tonight. We ought to want to go because the prodigal is going to come home one day and I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it when some of these prodigals walk the aisle. I don't want to miss it when Jason hits the altar. I want to be here. I don't want to miss it when Josh hits the altar. I, I want to watch Jenna when that happens. Don't you? The person you invited a long time ago may come. I wouldn't want to miss church. One of two things may happen. They get right with God and you miss it. Or they wonder where you are and probably die out of fellowship and lost. I wouldn't miss. That's why there was rejoicing in the Father's house the prodigal came home, and they began to be married. They rejoiced. They had a party. It was a wonderful time. Some of you say, well, preacher, it, it, it gets tough sometimes. Well, the tougher it gets, the more we ought to come. The elder brother didn't even care enough to be there when his brother came home. I don't know how, see, I know how much you love and care by looking at your attendance. The more you miss, the easier it is not to come. Some of you have figured that out. People start having trouble when they miss a lot of church. He was a poor brother. Well, something else I see about him is he, he did nothing to bring him home. Another way the story could have read, it could have read like this. Father, you think maybe that you could spare me, that you could do without me for a couple of days? Dad, you think maybe you could get one of the, the hired hands to do my job because, Daddy, I, I just want to see if I can go out and find my brother. 
but the story don't read that way. The boy had a lost brother, and not one time did he lift a finger to try and get him to come home. And that may have been all the prodigal was waiting on. You see, we don't know exactly how long he was in the far country. That may have been all that it took was just older brother come and say, it's time for you to get back home. I was about 18 years old. I was in a revival meeting. The evangelist was Tommy Bashirs. He came to that little old church that in our community every year preached revival, pulled a little old Airstream trailer, parked it in the church parking lot. I was out working cattle with uh, Ivan Kennedy and right there next to the church. And old Tommy came up, put his cowboy boot up on the rail and says, Hey, boy, I'm a big old boy. I think I'm tough, and all, I think I'm all that. And this old preacher stands about five foot nine. Old man. He says, boy, get over here. He's looking up at me. He said, we got revival over here at church. He said, you're, you're that old Linton boy, ain't you? And I said, yeah. He said, you got a good mom and a good daddy, you got a good grandma. He said, but what I've been here and you're sorry and dirt. He said, I want you at church tonight. You hear me, boy? I went to church that night. I remember what he preached. He preached the price of a field. Naboth's Vineyard, price of a field. Never will forget it. End of the service, I sat as far back as I can on the back row, back seat. He's been pointing his finger at me all night, preaching right at me. Isn't that what we think? Aren't we so important? One verse, two verses, three verses. People were getting saved. People were coming. Then things happened. Uh, uh, my sister Gwenda was there. Sandy was there. My brother Cleon was there. I don't know why, what all of them were doing in at that time, but they were all in service that night. And here they began to come and try to drag me to the altar. It was totally out of character for Mama to do something like that. Mama gets out of her seat, walks back there, and says, Son, you need to get right. I didn't do it. My sisters came, told me, you need to get right. My brother came, streaming tears down his cheek, you need to get right. Grandma, 106 years old. I mean, it wasn't then. She was, she was a young woman back then. She was probably in her late 90s. But she, she come back, left the piano bench. She's playing the piano when she's in her 90s. She leaves the piano bench and comes back there to where I am. And all these people trying to get me to go to the altar, get right with God. And I left that building. I just kind of shoved them aside. I left the building, lit a cigarette as I walked out the door. And just fooey on you. But there wasn't a minute from that day forward. I got right about three months after that. Rough three months. But there wasn't a minute that I didn't think about that. There wasn't a moment that I didn't think about that. Maybe all that prodigal was waiting on was older brother to say, hey, hey, it's time for you to get back home. I close with this. Are you trying to get the lost and the backslidden in to the father's house? Or are you a poor brother? Have you tried to get them in? Or have you, have you just said, it's their own fault. It's their own doing. It's their problem, not mine. 
you're a poor brother. I don't want to be a poor brother. I want the story to read different in my life and my dealing with people. I want to be the one that goes to the pig pen and says, get up out of here. I look at a guy like David Sayer back there. And David, I'm so glad that we went. So glad. I mean, David's cleaned up. He's one of our best members now. Takes care of Judy with like nobody could even dream of. But I remember a day when he was in the pig pen. And that same story is all across this building, even on a Sunday night. We need to go get them. Are you a poor brother? Let's bow our heads and pray.